You are listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Jeremy's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Hello, everyone. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin, and I am back with part two of the Pam Hup series. A lot of you are fascinated by the case. Uh, again, if you recall, about a year ago or so, I covered the Pam Hupp case in five parts. Uh, last week, I had on Joel Schwartz, Russ Faria's criminal defense attorney, who did an interview. And I actually decided, because there's so much new uh, information in the case and new evidence and new movement, to actually re-record and just do a two-part series on it so that everyone can easily follow along. So that is what this episode will be. Before we get into it, let's just go ahead and get some really quick housekeeping out of the way. Uh, First, I would like to speak directly to our patrons. I love you. Thank you for your continued support. February's postcards are in the mail. I had to wait till the tail end to get everyone signed up for them, and those have been sent and on their way. Uh, I posted in our Facebook group, our Patreon Facebook group, about ordering the new stickers with a new fancy logo. Those are still being made. I have not received them yet. So once those have been received by me, I will be sending those out to all of you. Also, the graphic designer is currently working on apparel, t-shirts, and merch and stuff, uh, which again, if you are an executive producer on our Patreon, you will automatically get a new t-shirt with the new logo. Um, So yeah, if you are interested in following along on our Patreon, joining, financially backing the show, feel free to check that out at patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil. The case that I'm currently uh, doing right now, I've put episode one out, is the Smiley Face Killers. Uh, series of murders. The Missing Men of Boston is really how I'm framing it. So if you're interested in that case, I have episode two actually of that coming up this next week for our patrons. Um, It's really, really interesting. And before people start questioning my sanity, no, I don't believe in the smiley face killers per se, uh, but the series of murders, the missing men who end up being located dead in the harbor, the Charles River and surrounding areas. Um, it's pretty, pretty suspicious and and mind blowing. So that's the case that I'm covering for our Patreon currently. Aside from that, guys, don't forget, you can follow us all across social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, the whole bit. And the website is we saw the devil.com. Later this week, I will have the part two of the cannibal series that I started a couple weeks ago. And then next week, I will be going into part two and tying up the Marilyn Monroe series. Uh, that I started the second half of that, where we will discuss all of the evidence for and against Marilyn Monroe's death uh, in terms of was she murdered? Was it natural? Was it an overdose? It's actually quite insane how much information has either been declassified from the U.S. government and how much other stuff has transpired and surfaced since her death. So we are going to cover all of those. Again, cannibals this week, Marilyn Monroe next week. And I also just want to to shout out, I don't know how many of you guys are following along with the crisis in Ukraine. I'm glued to it. I have a dual monitor set up in my office and I have Al Jazeera, MSNBC, CNN. I have all of the channels going at the same time where I can watch headlines. I'm in a really amazing discord that basically aggregates all news stories and video from the front lines and I've just been following along so heavily because in my lifetime, I've never witnessed anything like this. And my heart absolutely breaks for the Ukrainian people. So we do have some listeners in Ukraine. Uh, I can see countries where our listeners come from, and we do actually have a handful of listeners from Ukraine. So please stay safe. You are in our thoughts. All of this is just so unbelievable. And to the other listeners who are following this just as appalled as the rest of us, Make sure you stay hydrated, take mental health breaks. It can be actually pretty horrifying to follow this stuff consistently and really get bogged down. I know that a lot of my friends who are also news junkies like me and just really empathetic people overall are struggling a little bit with all of this going on in the world right now. You know, threat of nuclear holocaust on the table now, Um, the Ukrainian people, the deaths coming out of there. It's terrifying. Hold your loved ones tight, take some mental health breaks and stay hydrated. 
But let's go ahead and go back to Pam Hop. So far, we've covered how her best friend, Betsy Faria, ended up murdered with 55 stab wounds only four days after making Pam Hop her life insurance beneficiary. Again, Betsy Faria's husband, Russ, was tried for her murder and convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. All of this is recapping, I'm sure you guys remember, but after spending almost four years in prison, he finally successfully appealed for a new trial and was acquitted of all charges. In the last episode, as well as in my interview with Joel Schwartz, we discussed the corruption, ineptitude, and overall nefariousness of the police and the prosecution in that trial. I mean, really, if a case doesn't make your blood boil like this one does, I have no idea what will. And just wait until we're at the end of this episode. You will want to go on some sort of spree. Shopping or otherwise, I don't know, but it's just so infuriating. Now, because this case is so complex, with multiple ongoing arcs at the same time here, we are actually going to backtrack a little bit. Back to Russ Faria's first trial. If you recall... Right before Russ's first trial, which began on November 18th, 2013, police investigators interviewed Pam Hupp multiple times. She was the last person to see Betsy. It made sense. Police were aware of the life insurance policy change and questioned her about it. She was immediately defensive and brought up her mother, Shirley Newman, using Shirley as almost a defense as to why she had no motive for money. Shirley Newman, Pam Hupp's 78-year-old mother, died just four months after that interview, on October 31st, 2013, Halloween evening, just two and a half weeks before Russ Faria's trial started. She had actually fallen off the railing from her third floor apartment at an upscale and gated assisted living facility. There had been no witnesses, and police deemed it an accident. Also, Pam Hopp was the last person to see her alive. Let's break down what happened here. Shirley's husband, and also Pam Hupp's father, he died in the year 2000. When Shirley became unable to care for herself, Pam and her three siblings worked together to get her into the Lakeview Park Independent Senior Living Community in Fenton, Missouri. Pam would frequently visit her, like frequently. During the day on October 29, 2013, Shirley had a doctor's appointment. Pam transported her to the appointment, and then Shirley spent the night at her house spending time with Pam's family. The next day, at roughly 5 p.m., Pam and Shirley arrived back at Lakeview Park. Pam instructed the facility's staff not to expect her mom for either dinner or breakfast. She then left. The next day, on Halloween, at 2.30 p.m., a housekeeper found Shirley Newman dead underneath her third-floor balcony. There was damage to the railing, and she had fallen to her death. After two police investigations, the St. Louis County Medical Examiner's Office deemed Shirley Newman's death an accident. Shirley had died from blunt force trauma to the chest from a fall, and the medical examiner also found 0.84 micrograms of Zolpidem, a generic Ambien, in her blood. This was more than eight times what someone her age and size should be taking. But still, it was ruled an accident. An accident, even though a structural engineer took a look at it and said that there was no way a woman of Shirley Newman's weight and height could cause damage to six rails. Did I, and I also, I think, failed to mention that Shirley Newman was in a freaking wheelchair. Pam Hupp was the last person to see her alive, yet Pam Hupp was never interviewed. Her siblings, however, had been, even though they weren't even present and hadn't seen their mother in years. In the first trial, Russ was convicted and sentenced to life in prison just a few weeks later. Shirley Newman's death and Pam's presence was not investigated or considered in Russ's trial at that time. Moving on. January of 2014. As we talked about in the first episode, the St. Louis Dispatch and KTVI began a deep dive investigation into Betsy Faria's death along with Pam Hupp after Russ was initially convicted. Journalist Chris Hayes from KTVI became the face of this investigation as a whole. You can still see a lot of his original YouTube videos on his YouTube um, right from the very beginning as he was covering the trial. He actually interviewed Russ Faria multiple times and even went to visit Pam Hupp at her home and followed her around town a little bit. So all credit goes to Chris Hayes and KTVI for that. In part one, I also discussed how 
While preparing for that first trial, a police investigator asked Pam Hupp why she hadn't dispersed the money to Betsy Faria's daughters, that life insurance money. Pam more or less used her own mother as a defense. The detective convinced her that she needed to put that money in a revocable trust fund, which she did, but then she canceled it three weeks after Russ's conviction. In April of 2014, Betsy Faria's daughters sued Pam Hupp in a civil trial in an attempt to claim that life insurance money. In February of 2015, Russ Faria's retrial was approved. Pam Hupp at that time met with prosecutor Leah Askey for yet another interview. The two women talked about a wide variety of topics, including the insurance money that Pam Hupp had declined to give Betsy's daughters. In that interview, Pam Hupp flat out admitted that she was not going to give them the money. She claimed that Betsy Faria's daughters, by repeatedly contacting her to obtain that money, said she, she said that they were bullying her. Leah Askey also brought up the death of Pam's mom, Shirley, who again had half a million dollars. Pam's own mother had $500,000, a half a million dollar life insurance policy. As soon as she asked that, Pam became very defensive and once again defended herself from an accusation that had not even been made. But wait, there's more. Pam had a new memory resurface. Now, four years later, she recalled somehow seeing Russ Faria and another man sitting outside the Faria home the night of the murder. Isn't that amazing? After all the evidence was provided, Thankfully, Russ was acquitted on November 7th of 2015. And as I stated also in the last episode, that's not where this story ends, neither for Russ Faria nor for Pam Hupp. You see, during all of this, even when Russ Faria had been cleared, Fox 2 KTVI was still independently investigating the case. They found multiple questionable rulings in 2014 and then again in 2016. And Hello, Pam freaking Hub. Something was going on there. In July of 2016, Russ Faria filed a civil rights lawsuit against Leah Askey and three officers from the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office. He claimed that they had, quote, fabricated evidence, ignored exonerating evidence, and failed to investigate the other obvious suspect. Obviously, a reference to Pam Hub. Just a month later, on August 16th of 2016, the St. Charles Emergency Dispatch received the following 911 call from Pam Hupp. I'm going to go ahead and play Pam Hupp's 911 call to police, and it does cut out before you hear the five life-ending gunshots. 911, what's your emergency? Hey, hello, someone in my house. Help. What's your emergency? Help. What are you going to do? You want to use your what? As you just heard, Pam Hupp called 911 to report that a man was breaking into her home. She claimed that he had gotten into her car with her, held a knife to her throat, and demanded that she take him to the bank to, quote, get Russ's money. She said that she was able to push him off and run into the home where he pursued her. She said she was able to run into her bedroom where she grabbed a 38 Ruger LCR. And as he came, quote, after her like a madman, she shot him five times, ending his life in the hallway. When police arrived at Pam Hupp's home, they discovered 33-year-old Louis Gumpenberger, deceased from gunshot wounds, outside of Pam Hupp's bedroom. Louis Gumpenberger had lived a tragic life. At the age of 22, he had been in a horrific car accident and sustained multiple severe injuries. These injuries, including a severe TBI, left him both mentally and physically impaired. Investigators at the scene immediately discovered a note in Lewis's pocket. It read, quote, Kidnap Hup, get Russ's money from Hup at her bank, kill Hup, take Hup back to house and get rid of her, make it look like Russ's wife. Make sure knife sticking out of neck. 
the police obviously were immediately suspicious of this. And they did not believe Pam Hupp's story even from that very moment forward. However, Pam willingly went to the Fallon Police Department to be interviewed immediately after the shooting. Her very first spoken words in the four-hour police interview that day were, quote, Is this going to be filmed? Because I always appear on the news with Chris Hayes. Pam told investigators the exact same story about Lewis Gumpenberger's attack and pursuit. She claimed that a car had squealed up in front of her house and that Lewis had gotten out of it. The driver of Lewis's car, you may ask, she described Russ Faria to a T without explicitly naming him. And during their invest during the investigation of all of this guys, Pam Hop's story was just obliterated. And let me list all the reasons how. Let's talk about the evidence obtained and like what was included with us. First, Cell phone records showed that Pam Hupp had been in Lewis Gumbenberger's neighborhood less than one hour before the shooting. She claimed to have never met him, and his neighborhood was a mobile home park on the other side of the town. There was zero reason for Pam Hupp to be in his neighborhood. Zero. Also, six days prior, a woman by the name of Carol Alford had called police to report that a woman who very, very closely uh, match Pam Hupp's description, had approached her claiming to be an NBC Dateline producer. The woman had offered Carol $1,000 to reenact a 911 call. And Carol Alford is brilliant. Seriously, kudos to this woman. I have never been more impressed in a case that I have researched. She was so sketched out by Pam Hupp, and she did not believe who Pam Hupp said she was, that she even lured Pam Hupp up her driveway just in order to get her security camera to pick up on Pam's car license plate. And upon investigation of that, it was in fact Pam Hupp in her own personal vehicle, and because of Carol Alford, that's how they were able to to pin that on Pam. Third, a second witness, Brent Charlton, informed police that Pam Hub had approached him with a similar proposition, also in the same mobile home neighborhood. Number four, police found nine $100 bills in Lewis Gumpenberger's pocket. A tenth $100 bill was found on Pam Hub's dresser in her bedroom. And in case you weren't aware, cash has serial numbers. That tenth bill had a sequential serial number to four of the nine bills found on Lewis Gumpenberger's body. So just in case you're thinking about putting a hit or paying someone to commit a crime, guys, when you withdraw money out of an ATM, you know, bills and whatnot, sometimes they can come in stacks of the, and the serial numbers will match. So Pam Hupp totally got fucked on that one. Number five, police investigators determined that the knife that Lewis Gumpenberger supposedly had, you know, had threatened Pam Hupp with, had been purchased at the Dollar Tree in O'Fallon, along with other items found in Pam Hupp's home, like the pen and paper used to write the murder instructions, supposedly from Russ Faria. Pam Hupp literally went shopping at the freaking Dollar Tree and bought the fake murder weapon along with the other household items. I mean, she's literally the brightest criminal ever of all time. And again, speaking of that knife, that knife was found in Pam Hub. The knife that was found in Pam Hub's car was found wedged between the passenger seat and the middle console. Similarly, the knives in Pam Hub's kitchen were wedged between the stove and the counter. So a similar method of storing it. It was very clear that a carpet swath had been placed at the end of the hallway with the purpose of protecting the carpet from his blood. I mean, this woman is so evil and so psychotic in her planning. As she was planning to murder someone, right, um, to fake, to try to pin this on Russ, as she was planning this murder, she was like, well, shit, I guess I better put down like a, a piece of carpet or something to keep that blood off of my nice rug. That's how psychotic this woman is. And Lewis Gumpenberger's impairments, uh, remember, they were mental and physical. Police believed that they would not have allowed him to follow through or carry out the attack on Pam Hupp, that Lewis Gumpenberger, because of his impairments, could not physically chase after her, try to stab her, and pursue her into her home. The St. Charles County prosecuting attorney, 
and the Fallon chief of police both believed that Pam Hupp had gone into Lewis Gumpenberger's mobile home park and presented herself as Kathy, a producer for Dateline NBC. She offered $1,000 for him to reenact that 911 call and then shot him in order to implicate Russ Faria in her attempted murder. She then planted the knife and the note on his dead body. Pam Hupp was picked up and arrested seven days later and charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action. And this isn't a podcast, guys, where I put, like, sound effects and stuff like that in. But if there was ever a call for, like, an audience clap and, like, standing ovation and clap, 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 like, right now would be the moment I'd be like, dude. And here's how it all played out. So Pam Hupp drove across town to the mobile home park and pretended to be an NBC producer named Kathy who was looking for someone to reenact a 911 call. Again, the first person she encountered was, was Carol Alford. Carol, however, again, instinctively knew that something wasn't right with this bitch and was very suspicious. Pam promised her that $1,000 and said that she needed to come to a home in O'Fallon. Carol did actually, guys, get in the car with her, but her gut instincts got the better of her immediately. She said that it was just ice cold, creepy, and she actually, before they even got to the end of the street, she asked uh, Kathy, quote unquote Kathy, to take her back to her home so she could check on her son. She so instinctually knew that something was wrong here that she told her that she had to go check on her son and to take her back home. The real reason is that she did it so that she could have her home security camera snag the car's license plate. She then made the excuse of like why she couldn't go back with Pam, uh, Kathy, is that she had to go pick up her son from school and didn't have time. Now, what Carol Alford really did is she called police with a full description and told them everything. Carol Alford literally dodged an actual bullet by doing this. She would not have stood a chance. Louis Gumbenberger, unfortunately, did not dodge a bullet. Once there, um, Pam continued with her plan. Um, she picked, she did the exact same thing to Lewis. She picked him up out of the mobile home park. She took him to her house. Unfortunately, they did make it there. And as he followed her into her home, though, she called police telling them that she was being attacked in her garage and the attacker was pursuing her into her home. As Lewis made it to the end of the hallway in Pam's bedroom, she shot him five times with that Ruger LCR revolver, killing him. Now, as I mentioned in the previous episode, uh, police were immediately suspicious. Pam wasn't a very bright murderess at the end of the day, and she literally had bought her murder kit at the dollar store, guys, like near her house, like a couple blocks away. That's where she where she bought her uh, her murder kit. The knife she <laughs> the knife she bought dollar store. The pen and notepad that she used to write the fake hit note to implicate Russ Freya dollar store. She was so consumed not only by hatred but also likely by fear that she would do anything to put Russ Russ Faria back behind bars. And just like that, Pam Hub's little house of cards and charade came crashing down and she was arrested on August 23rd of 2016. But wait, there's more. After being arrested and brought into the police station, police questioned her and read her her Miranda rights. They took down her attorney's information, asked her if she needed water, the restroom, and then they went to contact her attorneys to let them know. Now, Pam Hupp remained, remained behind in the room alone. This, this is in an interrogation room. Pam sat in almost complete stillness and contemplation for almost 10 full minutes. You then, and then all of this is on video, and you can find this video on YouTube. She then took a sip from a little water bottle in front of her that's on the table. And as she placed it back down on the table, she extends her ring and pinky finger out just a little bit to grab a ballpoint pen on the table. Now, as the police were still out of the interrogation room at this time, she lifted up the back of her shirt and lodged the pen in the back waistband of her pants. You see her take a super big deep breath, and then she just sat and waited. And then you see her feeling all around the sides of her neck, like she, like almost like she's checking for a pulse. The, the officers and investigators finally returned, and they brought with them a female deputy to escort Pam to the bathroom, to the restroom. About five minutes later, the CCTV cameras picked up audio from the restroom down the hall. And it's a bunch of yelling. I'm not going to play it. I did in the previous iteration of this episode, but it's a lot of just commotion and it's kind of painful to hear. Um, 
but it's kind of Pam, 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 and screaming. You see, Pam Hup, um, upon entering the restroom, waited a few minutes and then took that ballpoint pen out of her waistband and started stabbing herself in the neck and wrists. Like, she just went to town on herself. And you can see the photos of her injuries on our social media accounts if you go back a little bit on Instagram and Facebook. Um, They accompanied the previous episodes. That's why Pam Hupp looks so ridiculous in her booking fo- in her infamous booking photo is because those all of those big bandages were covering up her neck from all of her attempted stab stab wounds. St. Charles County Assistant Prosecutor Phil Gronweg would go on to call Pam Hupp's suicide attempt as quote consciousness of guilt. Although as we go further into this episode, I'll leave it up to you to decide just how much guilt you think Pam Hupp feels. Pam Hupp's bail was set at $2 million, and on December 16th of 2016, a grand jury finally indicted Pam Hupp for first-degree murder and armed criminal action. So, Charles County Prosecuting Attorney Tim Lomar announced that Pam Hupp had been charged with first-degree murder of Louis Gumpenberger. Again, guys, at this point, there were no charges against Pam for Betsy Faria's murder. Like, all this stuff was kind of, like, bubbling underneath. People kind of like, oh, that's probably probably pretty obvious, but there were were no official charges on the books as of yet. Her first court appearance was on January 31st, 2017, and she pled not guilty to all charges. Shortly thereafter, prosecutors came out and they stated that they would be seeking the death penalty due to the fact that her victim, Louis Gumpenberger, had both mental and physical disabilities. So Pam Hupp's trial date was set for June of 2019. Now, while Pam was in prison, if you thought that Betsy Faria's daughters who were shafted out of that life insurance money were, were done, you would be mistaken. They ended up suing Pam Hupp personally for that $150,000 in life insurance money because Pam Hupp had promised the money to them. And Pam Hupp also, like, likewise, refused to hand the money over to them. Why? Because she'd already spent it. You see, Pam Hupp bought a new house. And sure, she admitted to lying about where she put it, or even that she still had any money, which she didn't. She spent it. She even went so far as to say that she did it because the people bugging her about it were, quote, pissing her off. But unfortunately, the court ended up siding with Pam Hop. Betsy Faria's daughters filed an appeal, but the court upheld the, the first court's decision. So just goes to show, guys, if you have a life insurance policy, make sure whoever you want that money to go to is listed officially on that policy. With so much evidence against her, the key ended up being Pam's own words. Her 911 call was suspicious from the start. And I wish I had some sort of dramatically long, gripping story for you when it comes to Pam Hub's trial, like, you know, Russ Frias would <laughs> and have his uh, criminal defense attorney come on and talk about how crazy it was. But that's not how it played out at all. You see, there was so much overwhelming evidence that of Pam's guilt in this that she knew that she'd be found guilty. I mean, there was just no way. Her defense team struck a deal with the prosecution with the full support of Lewis Gumpenberger's family. I do feel like that is very important to mention here. Lewis Gumpenberger's family did, in fact, sign off on this in order to spare Pam Hub's life. In exchange for entering an Alford plea for the charges of first-degree murder and armed criminal action, again, they would spare her life. If you're a true crime junkie like me, you may be familiar with the Alford plea. The West Memphis Three, the name grouping Damian Eccles and his friends Jason Baldwin and uh, Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., they all utilized an Alford plea. In November of 2010, after new DNA evidence failed to connect the three of those men to the murder of three young boys, uh, the boys were named Stephen Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore, the Supreme Court ruled that the three men could present new evidence at a trial in an effort to establish their innocence. The prosecution, however, was hell-bent on maintaining a conviction. So a back-and-forth game uh, kind of ensued as far as what would a a new trial for the, the men would entail. And that's when the defense team came up with the idea of an Alfred plea. It's, quote, an explicit assertion of innocence while pleading guilty. The West Memphis Three refused to admit to any criminal act, but conceded that the state had evidence to be used against them. 
So the Alford plea is treated as a guilty plea for sentencing, yet it allows the individual using it to maintain their innocence. So the West Memphis Free, for, the West Memphis Three, for example, were then released from prison by a judge. An Alford plea means that Pam Hupp did plead guilty, but it doesn't necessarily mean that she was admitting to the crime. She acknowledged that the state had enough evidence against her to likely uh, convict her. So on June 19th of 2019, Pam Hupp entered the Alford plea and waived her right to a jury trial. And in a call to her husband after, she said, quote, because that's what they were expecting, all the gory details and me admitting that. And the judge said, no, she's not. And that's just not what it is. So they were not happy. The only option on the table for sentencing was life without the possibility of parole. And when Pam Hupp arrived in court for sentencing, she was smiling, laughing, and joking with her attorneys. As Chris Hayes from KTVI described it, Pam Hupp was laughing so hard that she was hunched over. And that didn't last too long. The judge sentenced her to the life in prison without possibility of parole, and Pam Hupp's ass was carted off to the Chillicothe Correctional Center in Chillicothe, Missouri, to carry out her sentence there. She later told media, as well as her husband Mark Hupp, that she only agreed to an Alford plea because she didn't want to put her family through a messy trial. In October of 2019, Louis Gumpenberger's mother, Margaret Birch, filed a lawsuit for wrongful death, fraud, and mis- misrepresentation against Pam Hupp. She was seeking, quote, a sum in excess of the jurisdictional limits of this court. The lawsuit was successful. And two years ago, in t- July of 2020, Margaret Birch was awarded a wrongful death judgment of $3 million. She knew and she publicly acknowledges that she knew that Pam Hupp didn't have $3 million, but that wasn't the point. Birch's attorney, Gary Berger, said the following in a press conference, quote, that's why we did this. We didn't want her to profit from her murders and crimes. You always hear about how years later there's this made-for-TV movie, and we don't want her to profit from that. And that's what Margaret told the judge today. Before Louis Gumpenberger had gotten into the tragic car accident that wrecked his mind and body, he he had, had actually he actually had a son. He was a single father who lived for his child. Because of his in, in limitations due to the wreck, he and his son lived with his mother. He made very little money from his job, but every Friday he would take his son to Walmart to pick out a toy. Margaret Birch now has custody of Louis Gumperberger's son, who was 11 years old at the time of his father's murder. And Gary Berger also filed a motion to garnish Hub's, uh, Hub's prison trust account. And this, I don't know why I find this so funny, but you know all of the COVID, the COVID-19 CARES Act, the relief, stim- uh, the relief stimulus that we received, like the $1,200, all of Pam Hub's $1,200 payments from the COVID CARES Act um, were garnished, which I just find that to be hilarious. In September of 2020, Pam Hupp herself got a stick up her butt, apparently, and wrote a motion to the judge. In her motion to vacate, she claimed that she was pressured by her attorneys to take the Alford deal and did not actually want to. And this is a direct uh, quote from her letter. She said, quote, Attorneys say they would set up meetings so I could talk to my family regarding this life-altering decision. I waited and waited as the clock ticked away. Interestingly enough, an initial hearing for that was scheduled for January 8th of last year. Pam Hupp's public defender was supposed to show up to plead her case. Uh, Hupp's victims and five members of the St. Charles County Prosecutor's Office all showed up to the courtroom. And they waited. And after waiting for over an hour, the public defender supervisor came forward to speak. Shockingly enough, it came forward that Pam Hupp's attorney was no longer even an attorney. He was no longer a public defender. The public defender's office either wasn't aware or didn't care that they had been that they had had a hearing and Pam Hupp didn't have an attorney. They were just like, well, guess she's SOL then. The supervisor acknowledged that Pam Hupp had run out of time to file that motion to vacate, to, to write the letter, but asked for another court date to be sure. The judge agreed, saying that he did not want any loose ends on this. And then another date was set for February uh, of last year. And then the judge tossed it out. Like he, he went through all of that. I was like, sure, you can get your public defender. You can get all your stuff together. We'll uh, ha- you know, have another, uh, another court date. And then he threw it out entirely, which means that Pam Hopp will remain a prisoner at the Chillicothe Correctional Center for the rest of her life. 
And that's not it. That's just that's just Lewis Gumpenberger, folks. Because Pam Hump's life continued to get worse. The month after Pam began her sentence for Lewis Gumpenberger's murder, her husband of 28 years, Mark Hupp, filed for divorce, citing that the marriage is, quote, irretrievably broken. Like, you don't say, sir. And this is a stark difference from 2016 Mark Hupp. Uh, back in 2016, when KTVI and the St. Louis Dispatch began their original investigation into Pam Hupp, uh, Mark Hupp accompanied Pam to court every single day. He even aggressively pushed cameras out of their path, like he was in full, pro- you know, performer protect mode. Now, the divorce filing may or may not have been due to the fact that just two weeks before he filed for it, a letter from the new Lincoln County prosecuting attorney, Mike Wood, came out and announced that Betsy Faria's murder case was being reviewed again. That's right, guys. Betsy Faria's murder case was reopened. The major case squad of St. Louis took another look at the case. At that point, all physical evidence had already been relocated to the St. Charles City Police Department to preserve investigative integrity. And again, this is, I I love that they actually um, doubled down and reiterated this. No officers from the original Lincoln County squad was allowed to participate in that investigation in any way. Because clearly, if you've listened to anything that we've ever done on the Pam Hub case, you realize just how fucking inept they all were. Also last year, the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office posted almost 1,200 pages of the major case squad's reports and files from the original Betsy Faria investigation outline. They said it was, quote, in the spirit of transparency after renewed attention on the story. And I have read all 1,200 pages, guys. Uh, I highly suggest you do too. Read to your heart's desire. It's just absolutely insane. And that's the thing. I could have kept Joel Schwartz, uh, Russ Faria's defense attorney, on the on the phone for probably 40 hours discussing this case. This really short, um, you know, two series episode and series that I'm doing on the Pam Hupp case doesn't even get to a corner, a fraction of how just insane this case is, all the different pieces of evidence, what was, what was not included in the trial, um, or even investigated. It's just absolutely insane to me. But read the read the documents. They are still, I double-checked the link, and they are still there. If you look up Lincoln County Sheriff's Office, Pam Hupp, uh, you will be able to find those documents. And finally, guys, on July 12th, 2021, Pam Hupp was officially charged and arrested for the murder of Betsy Faria. The charges are first-degree murder and armed criminal action, just like Russ Faria's charges were in the beginning. The prosecutor on the case? Newly elected Lincoln County Prosecutor Mike Wood, whose name might ring a bell. And that's not all, folks. He's seeking the death penalty. They gave her the, um, you know, the, the opt-out with Louis Gumpenberger, uh, courtesy and, you know, signed off on by his family. Not so with Betsy Faria. They're going all in. In announcing the charges in a press conference, Mike Wood said, quote, I do not take lightly the decision to pursue the death penalty. But this case stands alone in its heinousness and depravity, such that it shocks the conscience. One of the aggravating factors we were obviously able to rely on with a death penalty was that she murdered someone for insurance money. But I will specifically say this case struck very deep into our souls and into our conscience with a level of depravity not regularly seen. What I can say is that we have a person who not only murdered her friend, then mutilated the body, staged the scene, testified against an innocent man, and then once he was acquitted, went and murdered someone in St. Charles County to prevent herself from being considered as a suspect. I can't pick a case more depraved than that. And now we wait. Uh, we are currently waiting on the Pam Hupp trial for uh, Betsy Freya's murder, which I don't believe that there is a date on that currently. So. We will be covering that, like, literally, I think uh, Joel Schwartz called it gabble to gabble, because I just, (laughs) what do you guys think? Turning it over to you. Do you think that Pam Hupp should get the death penalty for the tragedy that she has inflicted on so many people? Russ Faria. Russ Faria and Betsy Faria, specifically Betsy Faria's daughters, the life insurance money. Louis Gumpenberger, Louis Gumpenberger's child, his parents. And don't forget, 
She may or may not have even murdered her own mother. I don't think that that case is actually going to get any legs. That one seems to kind of have fallen into the ether. Um, But don't forget, a structural engineer came out and said, okay, how can this very wee woman in a wheelchair somehow go up over railings and damage the railings on her way down and just and then have the eight times the legal limit of um a type of ambien in her system not legal limit but you know what i mean like the typical uh typical dose none of it makes sense all of that being known and being said do you think the death penalty is a good punishment and should be on the table we're gonna find out And also, because of the renewed interest in this case, uh, in May of 2020, a couple years ago, NBC Studios and Bloomhouse Television announced that they were creating a six-episode TV series called The Thing About Pam. Uh, Don't forget, there's also The Thing About Pam podcast. And this is also basically solely based on the murder of Betsy Faria. And if you haven't heard me talk about it enough lately, uh, Renee Zellweger will uh, portray Pam Hupp. Josh Duhamel will will play Russ Freya's attorney, Joel Schwartz, and Judy Greer will be taking over as prosecutor Leah Askey. But now it's a waiting game, guys. What do you think? It's, it's, It's crazy, isn't it? I just, I can't fathom all of this. I mean, I can't even fathom being in Pam Hupp's head and what living in that, that meat suit, that body uh, with that mind would feel like. Just, but that's it for today, guys. You have been listening to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin. Tying it up, if you would like to financially back the support the show and become part of the team, you can do so at our Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil. And speaking to our patrons, postcards have been sent. Uh, they should be on their way. I'm still waiting on receiving the new updated stickers. All of you will get an updated sticker and then all new executive producers will get a t-shirt with a new logo on it um, automatically. So thank you guys so much for your support. Check us out until next crime.